and with regard to the introduction, Tanai uh, did um, his um, biology degree at the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. In fact, we both went to the same university, sort of different years, we didn't know each other until uh, Tanai came to the UK. But then he did a PhD in chemistry in Sweden at the University of Uppsala University. And then he did a, a postdoc with Bill Rutherford, um, who is um, a very well-known scientist working on photosynthesis. Um, and this year, Tanai uh, was awarded a very prestigious fellowship one of the UKRI Future Leadership um, Fellowships. So, Tanai, over to you, and thank you for coming um, to, or it's sort of agreeing to give a talk in a, our sem seminar series. So, um, all over to Tanai. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Casey, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to have the chance to talk to you about my, fabrics, my favorite subject which is the evolution of photosynthesis. And uh, I hope to keep you entertained for the next 40 to 45 minutes. We are gonna go to the, the fundamentals of the evolution of photosynthesis. And gonna, we are gonna question this. We are gonna have the perspective of uh, the structural and functional biology of the, of the, photosyn of the photosystems that uh, enables photosynthesis. Uh, and, uh, and then towards the end, I'm going to uh, rush through a few slides uh, more focused on the phylogenetic aspect, uh, insight from molecular clock analysis. Okay, let's get started. So in here, I'm just summarizing uh, some of the fundamentals of photosynthesis, the evolution of photosynthesis that we generally uh, take as fact. Uh, first of all, it is thought that the origin of life is dark. And what I mean with that is that we think that there was no photosynthesis, at least in the way that we understand it today, involved at all in the origin of life. And that is because we think that photosynthesis evolved in bacteria, in a particular group of bacteria. And we could debate uh, uh, which of bacteria this was, if, if any, uh, uh, but we think that it happened in bacteria and that is because we have not found photosynthesis, and here I refer to chlorophyll, bacterial chlorophyll-based photosynthesis, that we haven't found this in archaea, right? So we think that it is a bacterial process, or we have thought that it is a bacterial process. I, we also take as a fact that uh, anoxygenic photosynthesis evolved first, and then at a later point in time, from, uh, from an oxygenic photosynthesis, we have the emergence of oxygenic photosynthesis. And the span of time between the origin of an oxygenic and between the origin of oxygenic photosynthesis could be a very long time. It could be hundreds of millions of years, if not a billion years, depending on what the scenario you're considering. And the mechanisms of how oxygenic photosynthesis emerges from anoxygenic photosynthesis is uh, debated, uh, it's controversial, uh, uh, but we think that at least that's the way that it goes from anoxygenic to oxygenic. And finally, we think that oxygenic photosynthesis originated in cyanobacteria, and that is because cyanobacteria are the only known prokaryotes that are capable of oxygenic photosynthesis. And, uh, uh, because of this sequence of events that we take as fact, uh, uh, it is usually viewed, and oxygenic photosynthesis is usually viewed as, as, a, as a primitive process. And uh, bacteria that are capable of anoxygenic photosynthesis are usually considered to be, you know, kind of like, like missing links or, or, or primitive stages of, of what metabolism used to, to, to be like. And when I start re researching the, the evolution of photosynthesis, uh, already seven years ago, more or less, uh, I just start assuming that this is that this is correct, and I am and I'm trying to feed my observations and my results to this framework. But uh, with time, I 
I was no longer able to do that. And then so I started questioning the validity of these principles and you will see why. I hope this will become clear as we, as we go along. So I just wanted to, keep, to give you an example of how uh, this framework uh, leads to views like this. So I, I read this in a book chart that was published in, in about 2008. I was still doing my, my PhD. I was not doing any research on evolution photosynthesis, but I was always interested in the topic and it stayed with me. I was never able to forget. Uh, it is that the analogy that an oxygen photosynthesis it's like a, like a Model T Ford car, and oxygen photosynthesis uh, uh, is more like a Formula One racing car. So, but if you're a biologist and you study evolution uh, in, in organisms, uh, I, I, I think you would feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable with, with, that, with an analogy like this. So let's just review uh, very quickly uh, what is the, one of the main differences between oxygen and anoxygen photosynthesis. So here is a, a sketch uh, that I got from, from a, a genomic database, a very popular one, uh, on how for oxygen photosynthesis works. We have two photosystems working in series, a photosystem two or a type two photosystem which is the water splitting enzyme, the oxygen evolving enzyme. From this enzyme, all of the oxygen that we have in the atmosphere uh, comes from, eventually, from the splitting of water. Uh, and, uh, and then so this enzyme takes the energy of light, converts it into chemical energy to, that drain, to then drive water splitting, the decomposition of water into its constituents, and a flow of electrons, protons, and oxygen released as a byproduct. And the electron flow goes through the electron transport chain, and then the electrons are then re-energized by a second photosystem, a photosystem one, a type one photosystem. And, but, and all the two types of photosystems have a common origin, but this is, uh, uh, let's call it a different lineage of a, of a photosystem with a slightly different function. Uh, and then the electrons that are then re-energized by photosystem one, then goes, or a type one photosystem, then goes down metabolism to power carbonization, processes and the protons that are accumulated in the inner part of the membrane then are used to drive ADP synthesis through the ADP synthesis. And in oxygen photosynthesis, we have both photosystems working together. And an oxygen photosynthesis is characterized by having or by using only one photosystem, exclusively one, either a type two photosystem that cannot split water. And because of that is uh, called a uh, an oxygenic type two reaction center. I'm gonna to refer to it that way, an oxygenic type two photosystem. And, uh, or alternatively, uh, there are lineages of an oxygenic photocross that instead use a type one reaction center. Uh, but we never find them both together. Uh, this is very interesting because very recently uh, there was the discovery of, uh, of a green non sulfur uh, bacterium, the, the chloroflex soda. This has been uh, presented on a preprint. Uh, and we know that the chloroflexi or the, the green non sulfur bacteria, they are classically known to have type 2 reaction centers, but they now in a new lineage within this clade uh, with type 1 reaction centers have been discovered and characterized. And uh, it's interesting because it's, it had already been discuss in the literature that the green and sulfur bacteria had traits as if at some point in time there was an exchange of, of photosystems, kind of like mixed photos, uh, traits between those when you compare uh, with those that have type 1 or type 2 reaction centers. It's a very fascinating uh, study, so please have a, have a look at that. Uh, so a lot of the, because of these features, a lot of the discussions of how oxygen photosynthesis emerges and, 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 the, and the reasons why we have this kind of distribution of photosynthesis that we are, uh, in the tree of life. A lot of, the, a lot of the explanations and discussions and conversations on, on this center around how is it that cyanobacteria ended up with two photosystems, either via horizontal gene transfer events or gene duplication events, uh, and so on. But we don't need to going to that detail right now. Um, today, we understand the structure and function of photosynthesis at an unprecedented level of atomic detail. It's, it's uh, unbelievable. And 
Because of this, I believe it is possible to resolve the evolution of photosynthesis at the same level of detail. And that is kind of my work. That's kind of like what I've been trying to do, kind of like translate the, our understanding of the structure and function of photosynthesis and atomic detail, detail into the evolution perspective. This one due to, uh, this is photosystem two, this is the water splitting enzyme, and I just want you to have an idea of what it, of what it looks like uh, in, in real life, uh, because when we uh, read a lot about the evolution of photosynthesis, most of the time we uh, encounter schemes that sometimes are not very loyal to what, to the complexity behind the, the photosystems. Uh, in gray, you see the protein scaffold, and then you see kind of this square part in here is, is where it's embedded in the photosynthetic membrane, and this is inside the membrane. Uh, like the, uh, on, it's extruding, uh, but in the inner part of the membrane, of the telecom membranes of, of, of cyanobacteria and plants. And in gray, you see the protein scaffold. There are many subunits. In green, you see chlorophylls. In red, you see carotenoids. There are quinones. There are lipids in here. There are chloride compounds. There are hames. And inside, deep in here, you can see the manganese glass, where the, where the magic happens. So here's where water is oxidized. And here, we have two photosystem tubes uh, bound together, which is the active form, the most active form of the enzyme uh, in, in cyanobacteria plants. Uh, and then we know now uh, we have a, you know, really good detail or atomic detail on how the water oxidizing, the oxygen evolving complex is bound, where all of the atoms are, where all of the water are, are bound. Uh, we have known this for a very long time. Uh, it's a gradual knowledge accumulated for uh, decades. And uh, more recently, uh, the, the field have reached a stage in which we have crystal structures in atomic detail at every step of the water oxidation cycle, right? And all of these, the structure and function, all of this is evolutionary information that we can, that we can then extract. And that is, that is what I've been trying to communicate through my, through my work. So now the discussions on these topics are more like to center around, you know, what this is this bond like 1.1 ohms from, or is it 1.2 ohms from? That's the, that's the kind of discussions we are, we are having now on, on, the, on the field. But when we look inside, when we go into like the core of the, of the photosystems, of the core of the reaction centers, this is, these are the bits that are conserved among all of the photosystems. And this is how we know that Photosynthesis, trophic based photosynthesis, have a single common origin. This is the conserved core among all of the photosystems. And here we have photosystem two. Here inside this core is where we have the photochemical pigments that uh, convert the energy of light into chemistry. Here we have the manganese cluster that I show you, bound by uh, D1 and D2. These are, they have this kind of symmetric configuration. Uh, so D1 and D2 originated from a gene duplication event. Uh, we have a similar uh, configuration in the other photosystems as well. So this is photosystem two and this is photosystem one. These are the ones from cyanobacteria and plants. And uh, one well, of the main differences between the type one and the type two photosystems is it's uh, the presence of these aerosophil cluster, which characterizes the type one photosystems. And this is like a, the electron acceptor of the photosystem. Uh, and in type two reaction centers, instead we have this quinone non-heme iron, this is an iron and a quinone. And you will see a little bit about that later on. We, we don't need to go into the details of the function of the process. I just want you to see this kind of configuration. Um, uh, this is the anoxygenic type 2 reaction center of the purple bacteria, its core. Uh, we have this L and M configuration, the PUF L, PUF M subunits that you may have heard of them before, also originated from a gene duplication event. And for system one, in say, anoxygenic plants, we have also that kind of PSA, A, PSA, B kind of configuration. So coming from a gene duplication event, so these are heterodimers. These are heterodimeric cores. And in anoxygenic photosynthesis, those that have type 1 reaction centers, instead they have a homodimeric core. That means that there is one single gene, and then so it is perfectly symmetrical. That is why I have put it here into two different shades of, of green. And this is the reaction center of the heliobacteria. This is the photosystem that we find within the Cutis phylum. 
And in here, I'm just very quickly presenting an overview of the evolutionary relationships of the TAC2 reaction centers. And these are, are, are rather simple and rather straightforward. And we don't really need to do a phylogenetic tree to figure this out. We can look at the structures. We can overlap the structures. We can look at the sequences. Just from the sequences, just by looking at a sequence alignment, it's, it's aided enough. Uh, and what we have is that we have two, this, this phylogenetic tree is characterized by uh, uh, two gene duplication events. One that leads to the one and the two, and the other one that leads to L and M, right? Uh, so the one and the two is an bacteria oxygenated photosynthesis, and this is an oxygenated photosynthesis. And so we have an ancestral type two reaction center that, at some point in time, is all two distinct tra evolutionary trajectories. One that eventually became the photosystems that we find in cyanobacteria that were inherited by cyanobacteria, and the other one, the ones that are in use in an oxygenated photosynthesis. Okay. And this is uh, the same for type one reaction centers. It's a very similar topology uh, in which that we have that kind of cyanobacteria and oxygen photosynthesis split. And then what we can see is that they, uh, these are homodimers, right? So we have only one branch. So we have that a, a, the, the type one reaction center, the homodimeric ones, they are more closely related to each other. And we can see this from for the structure, from the sequence. And so they are more likely to share a common ancestor to the description of the cyanobacteria photosystem, which is characterized by this gene replication event. Okay, so if we then put them together like this, I just want you to, to highlight, I just want to highlight this this deep divergence, okay? And this deep divergence between the anoxygenic photosystems and those using oxygenic photosynthesis. Regardless of their evolutionary history, we have this big, this deep uh, split. And uh, uh, as I was saying, I just want to reiterate this, uh, that uh, uh, this becomes evident uh, once uh, we look at the structures and we compare their functions and their sequences and so on. So I'm just gonna translate these pattern into these phylogenetic trees into some schemes. Uh, and then I'm gonna extract the main evolutionary uh, principles that we can draw out from these, that we can extract from, from these relationships. So that's what I'm doing here. So uh, here we have the type two reaction centers and here we have the type one reaction centers, LNM, the one, the two, PSA-A, PSA-B, this is for system two, for system one, cyanobacteria, this is just the heliobacteria, uh, the chlorobium, uh, acetobacteria, uh, PSCA, and well, whatever, type one reaction centers, right? And so as I, as I show you, reaction centers have a common origin, but each group, each type is monophyletic. That means that all type two reaction centers uh, can be traced back down their evolution to a single type two reaction center protein. And the same can be said for the type ones, and at this stage today, there are basically, there's very little sequence identity left between type two and type one. Uh, so the sequences cannot be aligned that well. There's a little bit left in certain regions and so on, but there's also been a structural rearrangements that led to this, this functional and structural divergence, right? Uh, that, allow, that then uh, kind of like changed the, 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 how the sequence is organized in the, and then so all reaction centers have a common origin, but each group is monophyletic. From this, then we can tell that the earliest divergence, the earliest event in the evolution of photosystems that we can then trace by that is recorded within the diversity that we have is the divergence of type one and type two reaction center this split. From this, then we can also conclude that the type one and type two divergence must antedate, must predate, must occur before the diversification of the known groups, whatever events, whatever diversification events that led to the known diversity of phototrophs. And the point I want to make here, which is usually overlooked, is that these divergences are a phylum level diversification processes in such a way that the photosystem one that we find in cyanobacteria when we compare it to the photosystems that we find in heliobacteria or chlorobium, the distances between these is as large as the distances that we find of the, of the phylum, of the phyla themselves, okay? 
and then so, but then it just rephrases the split in another way. So for both the criteria that we have today have the one and the two, right? Half photo systems that have the one and the two. But to reach that point in time, I need to go through several diversification events. First, I need for the two reactions that just evolve, right? And then I need a duplication that leads to the one and the two to occur, right? But this duplication happens before the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria, which inherited all of them, all cyanobacteria inherited D1 and D2, right? So these are events that go far back in time, really far back in time. Um, but, but it makes sense because we think that photosys photosynthesis is a very ancient event, right? It's a very ancient process. I think the earliest well accepted evidence for photosynthesis is say 3.4 billion years ago. And then so it makes sense that these diversification processes are very deep in time. Uh, which, but, the, but the way that the photosystems relate to each other and the phyla that would retain photosynthesis relate to each other makes it such a way that then these events are place at a very deep time within the evolution of bacteria itself. And we can therefore not place the origin of photosynthesis in any of the known groups of phototrophs. I hope that's clear. The other thing that we can note in here is that we have this deep oxygenic and anoxygenic divide, right? We cannot say that the photosystems that we find in cyanobacteria today originated from, say, say for example, the, the purple bacteria or or a green non sort of bacteria uh, that's, not, that's not supported by the relationships of the photosystems. Uh, and then so because of these relationships, then we cannot say really that anoxygenic photosystems or anoxygenic photosynthesis is really more primitive than oxygenic photosynthesis. And these are strongly constrained by these duplications and these relationships between the photosystems. Okay. So I, I just want to add a little bit of extra detail now. Here we have photosystem 2 and the anoxygenic type 2 reaction center and the type 1 reaction centers in here. And I have added to the core now the other important component of the core, which is the antenna core, the core antenna, which is this is the it's a light harvesting complex that is intimately associated with the photosystems. And what I want you to note is that photosystem 2, the, the water splitting insect, preserves these light harvesting complexes that are also found in the type one reaction centers, but they are missing in the anoxygenic type two reaction centers. And instead in these anoxygenic type two reaction centers, we have a, a different type of light harvesting complex. And it, it, this is really important because the antenna is not just a light harvesting complex, but in the case of photosystem two, it is intimately linked to water oxidation and the manganese cluster. And uh, in photosystem two, this antenna, the CP43 and CP47, they are two different, they are encoded into different genes. Uh, uh, originated from a gene duplication event, but in the type one reaction centers, the antenna part and the core part uh, are fused within the same gene. Okay. Uh, and then I'll show you soon why this is important. Now, I am just gonna split the photosystems, I'm just gonna crack them open, and I'm gonna, send you all, I'm gonna show you only one half, only, only, only one monomer. And I've added a little bit of extra complexity. Uh, uh, so, uh, I've changed the position of the photosystem, sorry about that, because of uh, different papers and so on. So here we have photosystem two, and this, this is the anoxygenic type two reaction center, and this is heliobacteria reaction center, and this is photosystem one. And in orange, you find the antenna domain, and then in the gray and blue, we have the, the core domain, where the photochemical pigments are bound. And in green here, I'm showing you the, 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 all the chlorophylls involved in light harvesting. Uh, and uh, the reason that I want to show you this is uh, I just want to make it evident, visually evident, that photosystem two, the water is split in enzyme, retains the ancestral state. And we can, uh, uh, we can tell this with confidence by the way in which the antenna and the core interact and are bound together in such a, in such a way that even though the, these are different proteins, there must be continuity. This is, the, this is a, 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 the antenna that has always been associated with photosystem two. 
which it is not found in, for, in the anoxyanitide 2 reaction centers. So I just wanted to make it very, very visually evident how it is it that photosystem 2 retains actually at a architectural level the ancestral state, unlike the anoxyanitide 2 reaction centers. I want to uh, emphasize this because uh, uh, the way that we understand the evolution of photosynthesis, uh, we have always assumed that photosystem 2 evolved directly from the purple bacteria reaction center. And that is the framework that we have used to understand evolution of photosynthesis. But it, 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 that is not the case, okay? And it is visually evident. Uh, just gonna make the same point here. Here, photosystem 2, you can see the manganese cluster in here. And, uh, you can see that the, uh, the purple bacteria reaction center is a tip. So as I was saying, then, then we can trace this architecture, this uh, structural, uh, let's say, uh, skeleton, uh, I'm not sure how to, how to describe it. So we can, we can trace these characteristics as far back as the divergence of type 1 and type 2 reaction centers, right? Because this is the ancestral state that was therefore lost in the anoxyanitide type 2 reaction center. And so the question is, why does the oxygen photosystem two? Why does photosystem two retains this antenna, unlike the anoxygenic type two reaction center? And a, and then a, and the other question is why is the antenna split from the core domain in photosystem two, unlike type one reaction center? And I want to before I answer that, I want to point this out. Uh, we think uh, that water oxidation, the water splitting, the capacity to evolve oxygen, actually started as a, in, when the photosystem was still a homodimer in a homodimeric stage. So before the divergence of the one and the two. And this we can tell with, I think, a pretty good confidence from the structures of the photosystem. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of that. There is a, I provide a very um, extensive rationale. And not only we can see the, the structural elements of this in the photosystems, but we can also tell that some of the uh, traits that photosystem 2 has evolved to protect itself against the formation of reactive oxygen species because of oxygen evolution can actually be traced back to before this duplication. And, uh, and if you want to know more about that, then uh, this has already been published, and I have actually now kind of like been extending this rationale even farther. So, and I'm gonna show you here, so this is photosystem two, and I'm only showing you here the antenna, the antenna, the antenna domain. And I'm just gonna focus around the manganese cluster. Okay, you can see here, and the, this is the ligand surrounding this, and then the antenna comes and connects and links to the manganese cluster directly. And in the D2 side, on the other side, where there is no manganese cluster, we have all of the symmetry of the same place, but then it's been kind of like changed as if to block uh, the access of water or, or manganese, as if, the, as, as, if, as if the site has been shut off. Uh, to such an extent that we also re retain the same domains that go into the, into the electron donor site in the D2 site and then insert themselves into, into, into the site. Okay, and then you can see here very clear as if there was at, at some point a, a manganese cluster in here. And then, but I can trace in extreme detail, uh, though we should bore you too much with this, how the D2 site actually becomes switched off. We can trace that. It's all recorded within the structural relationships of the, of the system. And uh, I've described that in this preprint that is now undergoing a period. Let me just check time. Okay. So then, uh, so then the reason why photosystem 2 retains this antenna has to do with the manganese cluster. So in this little letter to the editor, a, a very, very timid a, approach of, of, my, of myself, I, uh, for the first time ever, a questioned a, the rationale behind the idea that an oxygen photosynthesis gave rise to oxygen photosynthesis based on these uh, structural details. And here I say, look, the reason why photosystem 2 retains an antenna 
is because it's a strong interaction with the manganese cluster, okay? Uh, and then what happens later, this is February uh, uh, 2017, uh, then a few months later, what we have is the publication of the photosystem one, the whole model American photosystem one from the PBQ, from the Eliva. Uh, so as, as distantly related up to photosystem two as it is within the diversity of the known photosystems and photocurves. So what I'm, I'm very curious about this, and then so what I'm, what I'm doing is that I just overlap photosystem two with this heliobacterial reaction center, here is for system two, here is the heliobacterial reaction center. And what I found is that the heliobacterial reaction center retains uh, at, at, at its electron donor site, the same place where the manganese cluster is bound, a, a number of structural elements that are very, very strikingly similar to the photosystem system two, a manganese water oxidizing complex. And let me show you very quickly what that looks like. So here's the heliobacterial reaction center, here's photosystem two, and then we have that interaction between the antenna domain coming in and inserting itself into the electron donor side. And here we have a calcium binding site within the heliobacterial reaction center that we didn't know exist until, until we saw this structure. And in fact, uh, the authors who published uh, the structure did not describe this site uh, because well, they were focused on all the aspects of the structure that uh, were more relevant to their research. Uh, but I described it in this uh, review. Uh, and so the similarities are so incredible that, say, for example, in the heliobacterial reaction center, this calcium is bound by the carboxylic C terminus of the last amino acid of the reaction center core here. And in photosystem two, it is the same. The manganese the, and the calcium specifically are bound, are connected by the carboxylic C terminus of, 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 the, of, the, of the reaction center core. It's just a, 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 a mind blowing. When I saw this, a, a, it, it blew my mind. I almost cried. And so then when we then a, put it all together, then we, we, we see that the earliest reaction center, then because of this di type one, type two divergence, had already in place all of the structural elements that were required for the evolution of the water oxidation complex. And, and this relationship explains the position of the manganese cluster and where the calcium comes from and why the manganese cluster is coordinated in such peculiar ways. And it explains why for system two retains, in fact, an antenna. Because we need that antenna to have water oxidation and the manganese cluster. But we know, and then we also know, and we have known this for a very long time, uh, but we have never put it into its evolutionary context, that the reason why a uh, photosystem system two has a separate antenna and core system like this, unlike the type one reaction centers, is because of the different rates of damage and repair of the course of units in such a way that the core subunits are damaged because of reactive oxygen species uh, much more quicker, much quicker than the antenna. So it makes sense, it's more economically that uh, the antenna and the reaction center core are separate. But then this is the, the, the mind blowing aspect of this is that we can trace these elements to the divergence of type one and type two reaction center. So then, at this point in time, then at this point, then I have no option but to wonder if the origin of the two photosystems and the reason why we actually have two types of photosystems is because their divergence and their emergence occurred in the context of the establishment of oxygenic photosynthesis, not an oxygenic photosynthesis. And then the emergence of the oxygenic type 2 reaction centers is therefore a, a, a typical event, uh, 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 but in any case, we can also trace an oxygen photosynthesis to a very deep time, right? Almost immediately after the divergence of type one and type two reaction centers because of that deep divide that I was telling you about. So let's now, let's talk a little bit about a cyanobacteria and I'm gonna change pace now. I'm gonna really, really now rush through some uh, slides. We have been talking a lot about 
about the evolution of forest systems, but not really so much about the evolution of, of, of the species tree of, of, of bacteria as cyanobacteria itself. And one of the main characteristics of, of the evolution of cyanobacteria is that the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria, uh, which I define here, which is, it's, 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 you know, we can technically define in a very precise way this, this point, uh, this ancestor of cyanobacteria was already capable of oxidative photosynthesis. And at this point in time, oxidative photosynthesis has uh, gone through an evolutionary process and uh, all cyanobacteria retain photosynthesis that are virtually, virtually identical. Water oxidation happens by a mechanism that is identical for all of them. Uh, they all have D1, D2, PSA, 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 they have all of that, right? So this ancestor already had that. And one of the really exciting and really uh, interesting discoveries that have come from, from environmental genomics and metagenomics is the description of the, of the cyanobacteria closest relatives that have been found to be non-photosynthetic. Uh, these are the, the melina bacteria or the vampiro vibronia, the cerecitochromatia, the margulis bacteria, very diverse, very interesting groups of organisms. And because they don't have photosynthesis. At least we have not discovered anyone that any of these organisms with photosynthesis. Uh, then it's been speculated that uh, oxidative photosynthesis cooperation in the span of time between the divergence of these non-photosynthetic cyanobacteria uh, and, uh, and, and the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria, this span of time. And so what I've been trying to do is, uh, is, is to combine these two perspectives, right? Just from studying the evolution of the photosynthesis, we already know that oxygen photosynthesis is likely to be a very ancient, a, very, a deep event. Okay, so but the, how does it translate into the evolution of the tree of life? And um, if the photosystems are so ancient, then uh, you would imagine in that at least the ones using oxygen photosynthesis, then you would imagine that they will retain signatures of, of, of deep ancientness, right? So one of the things that I've been trying to do is to compare the evolution of photosystem two with the evolution of some enzymes that are a, unquestionably perhaps or well accepted to be as all as life itself. And uh, here I'm showing you ATP synthase, and here I'm showing you the RNA polymerase, one of the, the core subunits, the main beta subunit. And here, I, I, and then the, the evolution of ATP synthase is characterized by an ancient genuplication event that leads to the beta alpha configuration of the, of the, of the motor head, right? That is inherited by all life. And we think that this duplication even occurs before the divergence of, of archaea and bacteria. And it's a complex evolutionary process. Here I'm being uh, overly simplistic. Uh, but what we have is that, let's say, we have the alpha and beta gene duplication event. And here we have the most recent common of ancestor of, of archaea in the dark gray, and then here of bacteria in the dark gray. And then I'm representing here the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria and, and melanobacteria. And here in this green is the most recent common ancestor. And then I want you to see that here, here, this is this. And we can do the same for RNA polymerase, but instead of having a gene duplication event, what we have is the divergence of archaea and bacteria themselves, right? And then, so here we have the span of time or this, the, the distance that is equivalent to a period of time in between these two divergences. But when we compare to photosystem two, and this is at the same, exactly the same as scale, what we find is that we cannot really distinguish neither rates of evolution nor distances between the, du the duplications that lead to D1 and D2, that lead to CP42 and CP47, and those uh, as, as of the of the ADP synthase or RNA polymerase or the ribosome. And I have also been comparing with recent gene duplication events, uh, which show very different uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, so uh, 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 what this means, is that uh, because the rates and the distances are basically undistinguishable, if I were to apply a molecular clock approach to these evolutionary relationships, then uh, I won't be able to distinguish them. And that's exactly what I have done. 
I'm just very quickly going to show you. Here we have, a, it's a, just a molecular clock of, of RNA polymerase. We have the archaea here. Here is the bac bacteria and the different groups. Uh, here is time, and this is the same, but for our concatenated data set of ribosomal proteins. And um, we have that long span of time between uh, duplication or in here the, the last universal common ancestor and, and, and the most recent common ancestor of bacteria and archaea. Do not focus so much on the exact dates. I don't want to place a lot of emphasis on that. What I'm fascinated about is uh, the rates of evolution that we need to explain these divergences. And then here, I'm just going to extract the rates of evolution that we need for to calculate these that are, are embedded within inside the molecular clocks. And just plot them. Here is time, and this is the rate of evolution measured uh, substitutions per site per billion years. And what I want you to notice is these exponentially decaying the rates of evolution, right? Uh, from uh, the ancient duplication, or here the, the, the uh, no, not the ancient duplication, sorry, the, the, the bacteria archaea split. Uh, and this is for the ribosome, and then this is for RNA polymerase. And uh, now, this is the span of time between uh, the LUCA uh, the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria. And this is the span of time between the melanobacteria and the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria. Okay. Uh, and I first noted this when I was trying to understand the evolution of photosystem two and the course of units as a function of time. And here we have D1 and D2 and L and M. And here is the divergence of, of the gene duplication event that leads to D1 and D2. And remember that we have placed all of these ancestral traits back to the ancestral type 2 reactions. But I, here I was focusing on this duplication. And then I noted that same exponential decay in the rates associated with this duplication and then the radiation that we have. And then what I can do then is simulate using the molecular clock every possible evolutionary scenario by changing the span of time between these. A, a duplication and the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria. And I, what I want you to know here, I have to use it. Sorry, I am using a, a million years instead of a billion years. So, but it's the same scale, right? And it's gonna, we are seeing these same evolutionary process. So, we, I cannot squeeze the evolution of the photosystems to this a, a narrow span of time, this narrow span of time between the divergence of the of uh, non-photosynthetic cyanobacteria and cyanobacteria itself. And instead we find these very ancient uh, processes, right? Which I believe are signatures of, of deep time. And just, yes, just to finish, uh, uh, then I have also done the same for CP43 and CP47, and the alpha and beta of ATP synthase, and we have these same peculiar uh, 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 relationships. And this is just uh, here in orange, it's a scenario. This is just a simulation. It's a scenario in which I consider that the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria occurs after the great oxidation event or that it occurs uh, before the great oxidation event. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. And then here I am, this is just a control in which I am comparing with uh, a more recent event that I know happened after the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria, a duplication very similar to the alpha and beta, that the FTSH, uh, uh, which is a, is a HPAs. Uh, proteins, and we don't see that kind of features. And I have done that, but to many different types of duplication events, you can uh, uh, see that in here. And as I say, we can then, whatever we do, whatever simulation we do, whatever assumptions we make, we can never be, we will never be able to distinguish between uh, the photosystem two evolutionary patterns, patterns of molecular evolution, and those of these very ancient enzymes. And this is just the grand scheme of the evolution of photosynthesis. Putting it all together, and I want you to notice here for system two, what I have been showing you is only the tip of the iceberg. Here, this is the, the gene set of photosystem subunits here, of photosystem two and photosystem one, of one cyanobacteria, Crococidiopsis thermalis. And we have all of these complex evolutionary processes. So here is time, this is LNM, this is the Taiwan reaction centers. This is the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria. And then here we have the tree of life, cyanobacteria, right? And this is just a schematic representation of all of what I've been saying. 
that we cannot squeeze all of these evolutionary processes within this short a, a, a span of, of time. But remember that we have been tracing back the evolution of oxygen photosynthesis to even perhaps the split of type 1 and type 2 reaction centers themselves. So on that, it's all. Uh, in conclusion, the idea that an oxygen photosynthesis gives rise to oxygen photosynthesis overall a poor descriptor of the evolution of photosynthesis. And uh, I think we need to revisit the evolution of photosynthesis more carefully, reconsider it from the bottom up. Uh, and uh, it is possible that there was never actually a discrete origin of photosynthesis and that we can trace the processes to for chemical reactions that go back to the area of life itself. Uh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Tonai, for a fascinating talk. Um, so we have sort of about um, over 10 minutes for questions and comments. Um, before, because sometimes people go, I'll plug in the seminar for next week. Um, that's going to be at a different time, 4 p.m., because it's Paula Wallander from Stanford University. So um, we'll be sending an email and as well uh, tweeting about. Now, with regard to questions, people can text um, questions, put them in the chat, or if you want, if you prefer to speak and ask a question, we can unmute you as well. So. I think there is something in the chat here. Um, oh no. I don't think I can see the chat. No, I, I thought that the, there was something, but no. Um, any questions? I don't see anyone wanting to ask. Oh yeah, so Dennis Murphy. Hi, um, great stuff Tanai, very impressed. Um, this is going to change the uh, textbooks, you know, <laughs> about photosynthesis uh, if, um, if it all pans out. Um, I'm interested in going back to the very origins because the analogous uh, process in um, dark reactions, CO2 fixation, that's now been traced back probably to an enolase type enzyme that was present in LUCA. And therefore it was, it's now in archaea and bacteria, and then it became, these are the rubisco-like proteins, then they evolved to the multi-domain um, uh, rubisco that we have at the moment. Um, and my question is really about the uh, reaction center proteins of photosynthesis. You seem to have got back almost to Luca. Are there any candidates that you can think of from um, what we know about the Luca, the provisional genome possibility, any candidates that could look like precursors of, of such an enzyme? Uh, so it's interesting, yes, uh, yes uh, no. Uh, one of the things is that, uh, uh, that uh, already when we compare type 1 and type 2 reaction centers, there is already no sequence identity. So any other protein that is related to the photosystems that originated before the divergence of type one and type two reaction centers, will have no sequence identity left to the reaction center proteins. And so the only way to find out if there is any other enzyme that originated from reaction center proteins it will be if there is a structural elements that, uh, that resemble reaction centers. And uh, surprisingly, uh, and this is very puzzling, uh, it's already been suggested before, and it was suggested by uh, in, in the early 2000s, that uh, the cytochrome Bs of the cytochrome BC complexes uh, have a folding, uh, an, a, an arrangement of the cofactors of the hemes across the transmembrane helices that resemble uh, to a great deal a uh, the reaction, the reaction centers. Uh, it was suggested by then by, by the authors who described this, although it never, it never gained a lot of, a lot of traction, this idea that, uh, and because of, the, because of the way that we see the evolution of photosynthesis, he suggest, they suggested that perhaps the photosystems originated from cytochrome Bs. 
uh, I say the other way around. I say that perhaps uh, many of these bioenergetics enzymes uh, that we find in the in the, telecom, in the, in the membranes, uh, uh, they may all trace back. That to today have no no sequence identity, but they all may trace to 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 common origins. The uh, transmembrane helices binding cofactors, some of which, which may have had photochemical activity. Great. Okay. Thank you. For, thank you for the question. So I have here. There is a question. Uh, it goes, it's, it sort of has to do more with the geochemistry. And so how do you reconcile these results with the reducing environment prior to the gray oxygenation event? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated because uh, I, I am myself not a geochemist. Uh, so I, uh, my understanding of this, uh, as I've tried to understand the geochemistry, is that uh, the oxygenation of the planet. It's a, it's a complex interplay between geology and biology. And uh, for what I understand of the history of the subject, uh, even though the atmosphere uh, remained uh, mostly reducing or with traces of oxygen for the first two billion years, uh, we still have, say for example, there is a, the geochemistry, the red redox proxies have been Red have been interpreted to suggest, uh, say for example, oxygen oases, oxygen waves, uh, going back to uh, at least three billion years. And I think there is a, an emerging consensus from what I feel of the in the literature. Although I cannot say, I suppose not everybody agrees that at least by three billion years ago, some form of oxygen photosynthesis was already happening. And uh, but then oxygen photosynthesis have been suggested to have already occurred uh, uh, before that. Uh, by different authors at different points in time, at different proxies, and so on. So it's it's complex, and that's a, and that's a, that's the way that I that I see it, that uh, it, not necessarily the origin of oxygen photosynthesis and water oxidation will immediately lead to oxygenation of, of the planet. So, uh, but there is this complex is beyond beyond my expertise. I, I focus on what I can extract from the from the from the photos, the history of the photosystems themselves. And I mean, the other thing as well with regard to that question is, I imagine there is all these sort of minerals being oxidized with whatever oxygen was there. And there are a lot of different traits that happened sort of after, once you have the uh, common ancestor of cyanobacteria, uh, there are a bunch of different sort of traits that accumulate and these all appeared prior to the great oxygenation event. So there is definitely something that is happening with that, those sort of early sign of bacteria that kind of imply that there was also an expansion in their habitat. Sorry, I've just been thinking about this as well. So I figured yeah. I'd sort of say something about that. Um, so there is another question here. Could reactive species made in absence of oxygen in water mimic reactive oxygen species made in presence of oxygen? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Probably, yes. Yeah. So I've 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 I've, I've read in the literature, uh, for example, that uh, uh, we can also have things like a uh, reactive sulfur species that perhaps could uh, lead to different type, similar kind of damages. Or, for example, or from from NO, NO uh, chemistry could uh, result in also some reactive uh, species uh, um, that is all valid. Absolutely, uh, it's possible, but uh, uh, I am. Uh, so my approach has been to read the evolution of the photosystems, and, uh, and I think it is very clear from the photosystems themselves, especially photosystem two, that uh, that at least by the time, just even before the duplication, at least of the one and the two, uh, we already have some kind of like a very a powerful oxidative chemistry having evolved, uh, a, which already places, it's, 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 it already makes the photosystem different to any of the unoxidative photosystems that we know. Uh, in any case, I, uh, uh, the way that I see it is that uh, 
this complex oxidative chemistry, or a, well, not necessarily complex, but this oxidative chemistry, if, if it had access to manganese, it would very quickly uh, lead to uh, water oxidation, even if at the beginning uh, uh, it was in inefficient. So there are more questions. I'm going to sort of for a change. Um, oh no, that I thought that you wanted to mute. So there is another question. I'm going to read that um, from Karim. Um, if I get it right, the appearance of the calcium manganese complex is the marker for the appearance of oxygenic photosynthesis, and this may appear with what you call D zero. Um, is it something that can be tested experimentally or there is no other way theoretically that the presence of uh, cal the calcium manganese cluster e equals um, oxygenic photosynthesis? So I guess, you know, more on the experimental uh, Yes, yes. Uh, I think that it, there are ways. I think there are ways to resolve these experimental ways and to get a validation experimental validation both on the chemistry, the early chemistry of the photosystems, but also on the timing of the most recent common ancestor of cyanobacteria. And that is part of my fellowship, part of, of what I want to do with this future leaders fellowship. Uh, uh, and I've proposed to do some experiments uh, uh, that could perhaps uh, with time uh, and patience uh, uh, lead to to experimentally validating this. And one of the approaches that could be used that I find uh, attractive, although not uh, straightforward and, and, and simple, is uh, similar to what uh, Betul uh, Kashar was doing uh, for nitrogenase and for Rubisco as uh, the ancestral sequence reconstruction. And I've already attempted to do a little bit of that uh, computationally, uh, uh, but uh, there are challenges. There are challenges, uh, both on, on the reconstruction of the earliest gene and also the assembly of these into a forest system. But there are ways as well. Uh, another thing that I want to do is, uh, is, a, is, is a line, like a long-term cyanobacteria evolution experiment that I'm going to start, and I have recruited now people to start doing this. Uh, 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 it's uh, to measure, to try to measure uh, accurate rates of genome evolution uh, among uh, different lineages of cyanobacteria and then hopefully use those differences and those rates of evolution to then uh, 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 improve on the way that we calibrate uh, molecular clocks. Uh, so to hopefully get some experimental validations of, of, of these timings and, uh, and chemistries. Thank you. So one of the questions is from my student, Georgia. So maybe, you know, we can just sort of do it separately if, you know, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so there is one kind of in the astrobiology sort of realm of things. Should we have a go at that? Sure. Um, so great talk, very informative. Thank you. This question sort of veers towards the astrobiology. Could there be another mechanism similar to photosynthesis that breaks down another solvent? Um, for instance, methane instead of water. What are the chances then that a planet hosting multicellular life could be lacking in oxygen? Uh, what gases could be could be a replacement for oxygen? Kind of. Um, yeah, uh, this is interesting. Uh, I don't know, but I, I, I. One of the things that I've been thinking about is uh, is about. Uh, the possibility of the photosystems doing chemistry other, like a complex chemistry other than water oxidation, uh, not only from a from a from a applied perspective on the kind of like biotechnological aspects, but also fundamental aspects. And then we know that at least photosystem two has evolved other chemistry. Say, for example, and this is very novel, very interesting, the capacity of oxidizing chlorophyll A. To chlorophyll F. Uh, and then so I think uh, the reason why we don't see a, a, all the complex chemistry executed by the photosystem is to a great deal due to uh, the structure of the, of the trophic chain and ecological factors uh, of primary productivity and the consequences of this. 
Uh, but thinking about astrobiology, I think uh, if perhaps if things have gone another way and there were different evolutionary pressures, there may have evolved uh, some photosystems with chemistry that goes beyond water oxidation. I wouldn't know what kind of chemistry this could be, but I do, given the, the, the large distances between the photosystems, um, uh, I think that it is also possible that early on, when the photosystems were appearing for the first time, there was a lot of complex photochemistry happening mm -hmm. uh, that have not uh, survived until now. Cool. Thank you for that. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and hopefully see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you yeah, thank again you. for listening. Thank you, Patricia. Thank no. you, Casey.